Now, if you will just come this way, the voice was smooth and silky. It suggested that wonders existed which would make all you had seen so far become thin and flat and forgotten. Amazing things lay just around the corner, and the voice knew the way. But Frederick was five years old, and therefore he knew what voices really said, and it wasn't always what the words seemed to mean. This voice said, really, I hate you all, especially the boy, and this is the way out, and I shall be glad to see the last of you. The voice did not intend, after all, to lead the way up the secret stairs to the golden ball. The guide was a tall thin man, with a yellow hollowed face and eye holes so deep, and shadowed you could not be sure whether there were eyes in them or not. Not unless you looked hard into them, and so far Frederick had not found the courage to do that. Now and then he glanced up at the guide's face, but each time he was frightened away by the sight of the strangely small nose and the almost lipless mouth with the big white teeth that seemed to be fixed in a bitter grin. Yesterday was the magic morning when Jim was driving him around London in the open top car. Just him and Jim. They were stopped in busy traffic in Fleet Street. Look, said Frederick, pointing over the front of the car. That must be the biggest building in the world. The driver looked up at the cathedral. It looks big from here, because it's standing on top of a hill, Ludgate Hill, he said. But it's not as big as the Empire State Building in New York, and you've been up that. Frederick tipped his head back as far as it would go. The Great Dome was like an enormous bubble, and on top stood a high tower with a golden gallery around the bottom. And at the top of this tower was a golden ball with a golden cross on it. All the golden things shone in the sunlight, but the ball shone brightest of all. Don't be stupid, Jim, said Frederick. It's much higher than the Empire State Building. It's the biggest thing I've ever seen. And look at that lovely golden ball. I wish I had it to play with. I wonder if it comes off. Would you like me to climb up there? and fetch it for you, asked Jim with a smile. Would you, said Frederick, eagerly. Would you? Jim laughed. There was a time when he would have sighed and murmured under his breath, these rich people are all alike. Get me this, get me that, they say. Look, the moon shines pretty, get me that. But he had been driving for them for a long time now, and he knew that they were always wanting something. Not only to have something, but to go somewhere, see something new, have someone praise them, do things for them. They were always hoping to discover something that shone bright and new to fascinate them. Like the golden ball on the top of St. Paul's Cathedral on a sunny day, when you were five years old. Jim. You're not listening. Get me the ball, Jim. It's much, much bigger than you think, Freddy. When you're small, you don't realize the size things are. Six grown-up men could get inside that ball. It's no bigger than an apple, said Frederick. Perhaps it is an apple, a golden apple. I've always wanted a golden apple. I wonder if it is Jim. Do you think it is? Jim Bates opened his mouth, then closed it again. He had often done that in the service of the Stags. Mrs. Stag frequently found the truth unpleasant. Her son also believed only what he wanted to believe. I don't know, Freddy. We must go back to the hotel now, said Jim, quickly but firmly. Your mother said that you were to be back at one o'clock for lunch. Oh, said Frederick, disappointed. The car turned left at Ludgate Circus, then went through the side streets to Holborn and back to the hotel at Marble Arch. Frederick kept looking back, but he could not see St. Paul's again because of the shops and office buildings. He couldn't understand how such little buildings could hide it. But I can't, Frederick, not this afternoon, said Mrs. Stagg. We're having tea with Lady Cornford. Can we go tomorrow then, Mom? No, we're going home tomorrow. The corners of Frederick's mouth turned down. There were tears in his eyes. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Stagg, anxious to prevent her son's noisy screams. Well, look. I could just spare half an hour, no more. Frederick smiled. Thanks, Mom. Half an hour was a long time. Easily long enough to reach the golden apple. It was a long time but skeleton face, as Frederick silently named the guide, 
wasted it. When he had taken the little group around the cathedral, Frederick hoped that now they would go up to the golden ball. But the quiet, cold voice said, Now, if you will just come this way, and it led them down the stairs into the underground rooms where some of England's most famous people were buried. This cold, shadowy place seemed like the natural home of the voice. It seemed to Frederick that the voice wanted none of them to leave, it wanted them all to stay here. It would talk smoothly and quietly until it sent them to sleep and then, somehow, it would get them to lie stiff and dead with the others under the hard stone floor. I want to go upstairs, Frederick said. That was when the voice began to hate him. Now, if you will just come this way, they went upstairs, passed a notice saying to the golden gallery and ball, and up some more stairs, up and up and up. As they climbed behind the guide, Frederick became excited. Maybe this guide wouldn't give him the ball, which, of course, was really an apple, but if mom saw how much he wanted it, she would buy it for him. It didn't matter how much it cost mom was the richest lady in the world. She could buy him the whole cathedral, if she wanted to. But he only wanted the apple. The richest lady in the world was breathing heavily as she climbed. Oh dear. I didn't know it was going to take as long as this, she said. They got to the top of the stairs and Frederick followed the guide through the only doorway there. Ooh, they all said when they found they were standing on a narrow ledge which went right round the inside of the great dome. Only an iron rail stood between them and the ground, far, far below, where tiny people the size of insects moved around. Frederick looked up and saw that, although he was very high up, the golden apple was at least as high again above him. There must be more stairs somewhere that led up through the dome. Perhaps some secret stairs. He hesitated and tried to go back, but the heavy grown-ups around him pushed him forward. And then they stopped, because the guide had stopped. Skeleton Faye said. This is the famous whispering gallery. If you would please move around to the opposite side and stand listening against that wall. I don't want, began Frederick. But Mrs. Stagg grabbed his hand and said in a low, annoyed whisper, Oh, come on. The group moved slowly round, with the fearful drop on its right hand side. Some glanced down, but others dared not look. All were silent. Frederick wanted to run, but the cathedral was a place where you neither ran nor shouted. At last they reached the side of the gallery opposite the doorway, where the guide had remained standing, made tiny by distance. They arranged themselves in a line, kneeling with one knee on the seat, putting one ear close to the wall. Frederick did not put his ear very close. He did not wish to hear that voice again. But he did hear it, loud and clear, as if the guide were standing beside him, yet he could see him, a long way away with all the width of the dome between them. I am speaking only in a whisper, yet you hear me clearly. The pictures you can see on the inside of the dome were painted by Sir James Thornhill. They show events in the life of St. Paul. Frederick put his mouth close to the wall. We don't want to stay here, he said. We want to go up to the golden apple. Frederick, said his mother, shocked and alarmed. Her voice sounded amazingly loud under the great hollow dome. The guide's voice had stopped. There was a moment's awful silence during which Mrs. Stagg's face became redder and redder. Then, now, if you will just come this way, the voice was smooth and silky. It suggested that wonders existed which would make all you had seen so far become thin and flat and forgotten. But Frederick was five years old, and therefore he knew that the voice really said, I hate you all, especially the boy, and this is the way out, and I shall be glad to see the last of you. The voice did not intend, after all, to lead the way up the secret stairs to the golden ball. The group moved round the great half-circle back to the door, and to skeleton face. Frederick would not look up. He knew that deep in those dark eye holes hatred burned like a flame, and if the other people hadn't been there, he was glad now that he was in the middle of a group of grown-ups who could protect him. Staying close he watched his feet, and his mother's feet descending the stairs and soon they were crossing the black and white floor, then the dirty black steps outside the cathedral. He saw the car in Jim's smiling face, 
and the fear inside him slowly disappeared. Get in, Frederick, don't just stand there, said his mother, pushing him. Go as fast as you dare, Bates. We're ten minutes late now. What will Lady Cornford think of us? Frederick's behavior was not at its best at Lady Cornford's. He was silent, and, when forced to speak, rude, very rude. When they got back to the hotel, Mrs. Stagg punished him by sending him straight to bed. But he did not feel any guilt, only an aching regret that tomorrow they would be leaving London and leaving the golden apple behind. Someone else would come along and take the golden apple away while he was on the silly ship back at the silly school in Boston. He got out of bed and went to the window. He watched the buses moving in and out of Park Lane and the people in Hyde Park. It was summer and there was still an hour or two before it would be dark. Suddenly it seemed as if someone else had taken control of his body and was making it do things he hadn't yet decided to do. He found himself putting on his clothes and opening the door quietly. Then he was at the open window at the back of the building, climbing through it and descending the iron steps of the fire escape. It was a straight road back to St. Paul's, but it was a very long road, and his feet were tired as he climbed the dirty steps in the pale, rose-colored light coming up the hill from the sinking sun. He entered through the big doors and heard the sound of singing. At the other end of the building he saw the two lines of singers and the people watching them. No one noticed him move quickly between the chairs and up the stairs which led to the whispering gallery. All the guides should have left, including Skeleton Face. All he had to do was find a place to hide for a little while until everyone went home. Up the stairs he had noticed a corner where he could hide. He hoped he could reach it soon because his legs were aching and he was very tired. When he woke up, his legs and shoulders hurt after being curled up in that tight little corner. Rubbing them, he went exploring in the dark. How could he find the secret stairs to the apple? He wished he had remembered to bring a torch, but he hadn't intended to fall asleep and stay here until after it was dark. He was not afraid, because the ball shining in the sunlight still shone in his memory, and he felt that it was still shining somewhere above him. When he reached it and picked it, for it was just an apple really, it would continue to shine and light his way back down the stairs and along the streets to the hotel. He bumped into and half fell along the wall, then fell through a doorway. As he lay there, his foot discovered the top of some stairs. And then, quite clearly, he heard the slow steady sound of feet coming up those dark stairs. He must not be discovered. He got up quickly and went on through the doorway. He was in the whispering gallery now, lit by the pale yellow light of the moon. He hesitated. This was only one door, which was both the entrance to and exit from the gallery. The footsteps were louder now and began to echo. He ran from them, trying to make no noise and keeping close to the seat along the curving wall. Yet he was still not really frightened, only excited. At a place exactly opposite the door, the place where they had all stood listening that afternoon, he sat on a seat, curled against the wall, trying to make himself small, so that he could not be seen. He held his breath, afraid that the wall would catch the small sound, and send it echoing noisily round the dome. A cloud moved away from the moon, and the dark doorway on the far side of the gallery became visible. Below, in the cathedral, he saw now that there were a few little circles of electric light in the darkness. But now he watched the doorway opposite and waited. Soon a thin black shadow separated itself from the doorway. Then the cloud thickened under the moon, and the shadow became part of the blackness. He sat holding the edge of the seat, trembling a little, but not really afraid. Then his heart jumped into his throat as the voice spoke right beside him. A voice coldly polite but full of evil. Now, if you will just come this way. His trembling became a violent shaking, and a pain grabbed his stomach. His breath came in loud rapid gasps, and, for what seemed a long time, he sat staring with terror through the rail at the lights below, as far away as stars, afraid to look up at skeleton face standing over him. Afraid to look at the deep, shadowed eye holes in the white fixed smile. Shrinking from the imagined touch of a thin hand. 
but no hand touched him. Then the moon broke free of the cloud, throwing silvery light around him, and he saw that the shadow remained small and distant by the door. He began to hope it was not a man at all but the shadow of some ordinary thing he had not noticed before. Yet it had seemed to move. He watched it, relaxing slowly as the thin shadow remained still and unmoving. But he had not imagined the voice, which had been real enough. Perhaps everything you said in the whispering gallery went echoing round the gallery for ever and ever, because there was no way for it to get out. Like a fly caught in an upside-down bowl. All he had heard was an echo of the word skeleton face had kept using in the afternoon. Then he jumped again, as the same cold voice said right beside him, if you will just come this way. He began sweating, but he told himself that it was all right. The shadow hadn't moved, it was only that old echo again. He noticed it had dropped a word this time. How could the sound of the word now have escaped? But of course. It would have slipped out through the doorway as the echo went past. That was how echoes died, losing a piece every time they went slowly round. That had to be true, otherwise everything everybody ever said would go round and round forever, like a great crowd shouting all the time. Well, he couldn't just sit there. He had to find the stairs that went up to the golden apple. His mother might have already discovered that he wasn't in the hotel and would guess where he had gone and come after him. He stood up slowly, not taking his eyes off the shadow by the door. It remained still. And then the clouds covered the moon and the silvery light disappeared, and it was darker than ever. He could not go around the gallery in the darkness. But if there was no light, there could be no shadow. However, his fear was too strong, and he stood there holding the rail, and looking down at the little lights below. Suddenly he wished he was down there in the safe steady light that did not go out and leave you trapped on a high shelf and at the mercy of unseen shadows. But if he was down there he would be further away from the shining golden apple. To obtain that prize he had to be brave. His fingers became tied on the rail at the voice from the dark said, you will just come this way. This time it sounded less like a request and more like an order. You will just come this way. Frederick thought, it's all right really. If I stay here long enough, the echo will have no more words left, it will die, and perhaps the shadow will go with it. He was glad when the bright moonlight suddenly flooded the dome again. Or he was until, he screamed as he saw, that the shadow had moved nearly halfway around the gallery in the darkness, and was still moving steadily towards him. He turned and ran in the opposite direction. But the shadow had turned back and was moving quickly the other way to get to him, before he could reach the door. And it was moving faster than he could run. He turned round, gasping with terror, then little screams coming from his mouth as here and. For now he knew that the shadow was the shadow of death. And death wanted to take him, and put him with the other dead people under the cold floor of the cathedral. He was opposite the door again, and the shadow was back at the doorway. He fell onto the seat, gasping for breath. Then the voice came again, quietly this time, and softly persuasive, just come this way. It was a trap. He would not go. But there was still hope, because the voice had lost two of its words this time. The great dome was now full of moonlight, and the human figures in the pictures were like a silent audience, looking down at him. St. Paul seemed to be watching him. He stood up there, one hand pointing towards the top of the dome and the golden apple. That's the way you want to go, Frederick, his face said. I know, I know, whispered the boy. But how do I get up there? And the voice of death spoke again, calling, come this way. No, cried Frederick, jumping up and moving away from the seat. The shadow moved in the same direction, coming around to meet him. He ran back, and the shadow stopped, as if it were watching him and trying to guess what he intended to do, then it moved back to the doorway. And so Frederick stopped again, knowing that he could never reach the door safely, because the shadow could always get there first. Was there to be no end to this horrible game? Yes, he thought desperately, there must be an end when the echo dies. And that must be soon now. He put his hot forehead against the cool iron rail. There were, 
he noticed, pictures of angels just under the gallery. Angels flying confidently. He thought, if only I had wings. I could escape death and I could fly up there and pick the golden apple. His forehead burned, and his head ached. The angels seemed to advance, and move away again, as if they were flying over the back wall. He watched them for some time, and they seemed to smile and indicate that it was quite easy to fly. Anyone could do it. He could do it, if only he tried. Then suddenly he remembered the shadow, and looked at the opposite side of the gallery. And it was gone. But he saw a movement to his right, and there was a shadow, much taller, well past the halfway mark on its way to him. Even if Frederick ran his fastest, the shadow could catch him easily, before he could reach the door. It was skeleton face. He could see the dark eye holes, and the white teeth as the tall thin figure approached. Frederick climbed up onto the rail, balancing there. He looked up. Somewhere beyond the dome, was the shining prize he would never now reach. But St. Paul still pointed up and seemed to say, have faith. Have faith. And the angels seemed to be calling to him, have faith, Frederick, and you can fly like us. Have faith and you can fly up to the apple. Skeleton face was almost beside Frederick now, his mouth open to speak. This way, you can fly. You can fly. Have faith, called the angels. I have faith. I'm coming, said Frederick, with a new strength, he began to step forward, quite steadily and calmly. Frederick. It was his mother's voice, loud with alarm. A warm relief flooded over him. Mom had found him had got here just in time. She would save him. She would pay skeleton face to go away. She could pay anything, she was so rich. He looked eagerly around, but he couldn't see her. There was only skeleton face reaching for him. Suddenly he realized that the cry was only the echo of his mother's exclamation that afternoon. It must have been slowly moving in circles, round the gallery, ever since. He was sick with disappointment and then a bony hand reached for his ankle, and he jumped out into space. It wasn't a jump of faith. It was a jump to avoid death. In confusion and misery he fell past the angels, fell into darkness. The electric lights grew bigger as he fell, and they shone on something that lay below them. A golden disc. He was going straight towards it. Could it be that somehow he was succeeding after all? That he was to reach? The golden disc flashed up hugely now, blinding him. The night verger had glanced up to see what looked like a tiny figure balancing on the rail of the whispering gallery. And as he watched, it jumped out into space. My God, he said, and rushed forward. A thin shout came from above. Way. He watched the figure fall until it hit the large round brass plate in the floor. It was immediately above the place where Nelson was buried and immediately under the ball and cross 365 feet above. The verger hit his eyes. When he locked again, small rivers of blood were spreading from the broken little shape that lay on the brass plate. It was a small boy, a child. Dead, of course. He went to find the other night verger and brought him to see it. But now the brass plate shone clean and bright and clear. There was no body. There was no blood. The second verger put his arm round the other, who had suddenly begun to shake. He led him to a chair. Don't worry, Alex, he said. It's all right. It once happened to me. Alex looked at him in slow surprise, his hands shaking like those of a very old man. Nor are we the only one, said the second verger. It happens every now and then. When did it first really happen? More than twenty years ago. It was a boy named Stag, an American boy. He somehow found his way here, and got up there. He had been here in the afternoon, and for some reason wanted very much to return. He was due to go home the next day, so his mother guessed he might have come here. But she got here just too late, he was already on the rail, just as you and I saw him. She shouted his name, but he fell. Alex looked up at the dome. He jumped, he said in a low voice but he saw me. He must have thought he was going to hit me. He shouted way. Someone shouted way. 
I heard it too, when it happened to me. But it didn't sound like a boy's voice. He was only five. Then who was it? The second verger looked around uneasily. There have been many temples in this place, going back centuries, he said. Before this there were at least three other Christian churches, and long before, that the Romans had a temple here, for very different gods, his voice faded away, then he looked at Alex. What terrifies me is this, does that poor child have to suffer his dreadful experience over and over again, every time it happens? Is he caught in some cruel circle of time and unable to escape? I don't think so said Alex. What's past is past. By some trick of time we have seen that past, like looking at an old film, where the characters are only shadows. They sat side by side under the great dome in a little pool of light, each grateful that the other was there. All around them were black shadows, and under their fees, were the bones of the dead. The great and the small. The famous and the forgotten. The human and the, possibly non-human. Now, if you will just come this way, the voice was smooth and silky. It suggested that wonders existed which would make all you had seen so far become thin, and flat and forgotten. Amazing things lay just around the corner, and the voice knew the way, the end. Hope you have enjoyed the story. Come back to Let's to find more fascinating and exciting stories.